Everyone says the mixture of expert models have domain experts, i.e. math experts, code experts, language experts. That's the general story. But it's just not true. I went looking for domain experts in GPT OSS 20B. I didn't find any. But what I did find is way more interesting. But first of all, let me give a little bit of context. GPT OSS 20B is OpenAI's first open weight model since GPT 2, and it's a mixture of experts models. And if you're wondering how that compares to typical models, models in the past such as Llama 2, Llama 3, Mistral, etc., they were all typically dense models, i.e. every parameter in the model is active and available. Now that's expensive. But in a mixture of experts model, you have a pool of experts. In GPT OSS's case, it has 32 experts per layer, and only four of those experts are active at any one time. A router decides which ones to activate. The other 28, they just sit idle. Now that's the efficiency trick. You get a huge model that runs like a small model. Now, if you're wondering how the 21 billion parameters of GPT OSS breaks down, about 2 billion of those parameters are shared. That's things like embeddings, attention, the router, and they pretty much fire on every single token. The other 19 billion parameters are split across 768 expert blocks, i.e. 32 experts per layer across 24 mixture of experts layers. You kind of see how this works now. But as I said, only the top four experts fire for each token per layer, four out of 32. That's 12.5% of the model. So if we do the math slightly, that's 2 billion shared parameters plus 12.5% of 19 billion. That gives you around 3.6 billion active parameters per forward pass. Now, as I said, the obvious theory to how this works is this idea of domain experts. So something like expert 3 would handle math, expert 12 would handle language, expert 27 would handle code, and then the writer would write the math tokens to the math expert and the code tokens to the code expert. Makes sense, right? But I wanted to check that, so I built a probe to find out. So what this probe is gonna do is gonna send 12 different prompts against four different domains, i.e. math, code, language, and reasoning. And it's gonna send them all to layer 11. Now, if this theory is true, then what should happen is that the math tokens will go to the math expert and the code tokens will go to the code expert. The same expert should be activated every single time. Now, if we look at the results, if domain experts exist, then each domain should pretty much have different top experts. So the first thing to notice, if we look at the top five experts per domain, you can see that we have basically three experts overlapping across multiple domains. Now, let's take a look at the results for a second. If domain experts exist, then each domain should pretty much have different top experts, which they kind of do, but, one of the things I want you to notice is that experts are cutting across multiple domains. Look at E5, for example. You see that it's appearing in code and it's appearing in language as well. Now, if we drill down even further for a second, look at E12. E12 has a strong preference towards math, but it's also handling reasoning, it's handling code, and it's handling language. It's handling all four domains. And again, it's not the only one to do that. You can see that with E15 as well. So. These seven experts, if we really look at it, are handling all four domains. They're handling activations across every domain. They are not specializing to one particular domain. So maybe the problem here is not what we're asking, it's maybe how we're asking it. Okay, so we know it's not domain experts. Maybe, maybe it's simpler than this. Maybe routing is just the lookup table. Token 127 always goes to the same expert. Token def always goes to the same experts. It's context independent. If that's true, we should be able to predict routing just from the token alone. Now let's test that. So this time what we're gonna do is we're gonna send the same token, i.e. 127, and we're gonna run it through different contexts. So we'll run 127 solo, just the token. Um, we'll put 127 before addition, i.e. plus five. We'll put it before multiplication. We'll put it before division. We'll put it in assignment. We'll put it in a sentence. We'll do it in a function call. And then we'll do it as an array. So that, you know, we'll just put 127 in a different context there. And then if that um, is looking purely at the token types and it's context independent, then they should all go to the same expert. 
So how this token works, it is going to look at the expert it routes to just on the point of next token prediction. So at 127, we're looking just before 127 is predicted and we are gonna see what it comes back with. We're also going to look at how it's classified for the token after. Now, if we look at the results for a second here, do you, do you see what's going on here? So when 127 is at the beginning, E10, E15, E5, and E25 are all predicted. So that's pretty good as using the same expert, but it, then it's the same token there. On the next token, do you see what happens there? In this case, when the next token is a plus, you see E18, E6, E12, and E26. Again, if we look at the next operator there, which is in this case for the 127 multiplied by 89, notice that's a star, but we're still seeing different experts. We're seeing E6, E12, E19, and E26. It's not quite the same, but there's a little bit of overlap here. Here for the forward slash, we see E6, E19, E12, um, but for 127 itself, it's the same um, target. Now, notice what happens when it's in a sentence. The value is 127, but look here, E19, 18, 12, and 26. That is completely different when 127 was at the beginning. And again, in a function call, print 127, E12, E19, E4, and E26. Again, a different set of experts. These are not token independent, context is mattering. So if we look at what OpenMOE said in 2024, writing decisions are predominantly based on token IDs with minimal context relevance, at least for the GPT OSS 20B model, that's not quite true. It's more of same token, different structure, different routing. So what defines structure? So we know context matters, but what in this case is context doing? I needed a way to see how routing decisions are being made at scale. Not one token at a time, but looking at patterns. So I came up with this idea of a semantic trigram. So if we look at the diagram in front of us here, if we look at something like two plus three, from a semantic trigram perspective, that's more of num op num. So rather than looking at the individual number there, we're just saying that is a number and then plus is an operation. And therefore a structure perspective, um, prediction is probably gonna be made on those structures. And again, it pretty much works for everything, whether it's code or language, you can see in the case of something like for I in, like as a code, that comes down to a keyword, a variable, and then another keyword. Or if I'm looking at something that's more language based, happy means joyful, that can be broken down to adjective, synonym, adjective. But you're probably thinking to yourself, wait, this is next token prediction. The router isn't going to see the next token there um, if it's its position I. It's not gonna see token I plus one. Let me show you what I mean. So 12 categories, 60 prompts, every token tagged with its trigram pattern. And we can see that in arithmetic where we're gonna have patterns such as op, white space, number. We can see that in code where you're seeing beginning of sequence, keyword, uh, content word. And we have that with synonym, content word, synonym, content word. Or um, we see that with autonomous, which is content word, autonomous or a content word, and we can see it with analogies, keyword to content word, comparisons, content word, then end of sequence, you get the idea. Now what's really interesting is if we look at the peak layers by category. I want you to look at this for a second. Do you see what happens if we look at arithmetic for a example? The peak layers are layer three, layer zero, layer one. Um, similar for code, we see peak layers, layer zero, layer one, etc. But look what happens when we get to analogy. The peak layers are actually around a layer nine, a layer 11, a layer 12. Comparison, we can even get 11, 13, and 17. And then causation is like down at 21 there. Conditional, layer 20, 13, 18. So what does this mean? It means we can see that structure is really handled early in the pipeline, right? The early layers, layer zero, layer one, etc semantic relationships are happening round about the middle and then reasoning modifiers are coming late in the process it's a three-stage pipeline what kind of structure is this is the early layers how do these concepts relate is the middle layers and then the late layers is what logical operation applies these experts aren't domain specialists 
their pipeline stages. And again, in one of my earlier videos, I actually mapped out the layers of GPT OSS. And you can see there from that video, it's exactly what I said there. Those early layers are really looking at the structure and the task recognition, but down in the middle layers, that's where it's starting to figure out the semantic relationship. This is multiplied by this, L13, for example, being the classifier layer, L15 being the confidence router where it routes, et cetera. Chain of thought, et cetera, is happening in 1618. And then in uh, the later layers, it's performing a computation. And that fits in exactly what we are seeing there with the mixture of experts. And again, if you want to try this live, I've uh, created uh, an open source tool where you can go and interact and see what the trigrams are. So if I type in something like king is the queen as man is the woman, for example, again, you can see the tokenization that is occurring. And we can see some sort of specialization um, appearing even here. So you see, I've switched this to layer 11 at the moment, but you can see for things like is, to, as, you can start to see um, expert 18 is generally dominating that in those cases. But for things like content words, for example, uh, you know, things like woman, man, etc. You see E7 is really um, dominating that as well with E25 coming in. So what can we learn from this? Actually, we sort of see that E18 is handling the first half of the analogy structure really well. And we can kind of see that here. You see what I mean? You've got E18 is to, you know, queen as, but then what happens in the second half here it starts to drop off. Do you see it's coming out here, E18, it's coming lower and lower, E18, coming out there. So it's recognizing the X's to Y structure, but it's not really understanding the analogy. But a big question here is why E18? The, the, the router is just a linear function. It takes the hidden state, multiplies by a weight matrix, picks the top experts. There's no pattern detector in the router itself. It's just matrix multiplication. So something upstream must be encoded in these patterns, something that builds the hidden state. And that is, attention. So now that we understand the trigram concept, what I wanted to be able to do is probe the same token across different layers and with different contexts and see what happens and see the sensitivity of context. So I'm going to pass through uh, basically four different contexts. So two plus three, a minimal context, an instruction, calculate two plus three, sentence, the sum is two plus three, and a code result equals two plus three. And then we're going to look at each layers and see what happens. Now, as we start to analyze those layers, you can see in these early layers, layer zero, pretty much everything is going to E10 there. It doesn't matter whether it's minimal instruction sentence or code, but look what happens in layer 12, right? Minimal is going to expert A, instruction and sentence are going to expert 11, and code is going to E14. And then in the late layers where it's um, doing the actual operation, etc., cetera, and, and giving the output, you can see they're on completely different experts. Minimal's 25, instructions E14, sentence E17, and E8. So if we really look at what's going on here, in layer zero, the early layers, everything's going to the same expert, right? Whether it's minimal, whether it's instruction, whether it's sentence, whether it's code, same expert for all contexts. It's all going to expert 10. And remember those early layers are really about just trying to recognize what the token is in the first place. Whereas in the middle layers, it's really about the semantic relationships. And look what happens when we hit the middle layers around the layer 12, you see divergence. We now see three different experts and it's context sensitive, right? So the same token, different context. So in the case of instruction and sentence, it goes to E11, code goes to E14 and minimals at E8. But there we go in the later layers, again, they go even further out as well. Remember the later layers are actually what is gonna produce the uh, final output. Um, and you can sort of see here, minimal goes to expert 25, instruction E14, sentence E17, and code is going to E8. The early layers don't differentiate, but the later layers fully differentiate. And we can see that when we look at the attention patterns, especially in the middle layer, you can see the plus symbol is dominating the minimal uh, example, remember. And then if we look at things like instruction, where if we look at instruction and sentence, where it's going to export 11, look what's dominating here. It's, it's the space and the plus. Down here, it's the space and the plus. And we're seeing a little bit with the sentence there. And then when we're, we're at code levels, it's the plus, the space, and the equals there. It's a tension that is controlling this. The router is just reading what 
whenever attention wrote into the hidden state. If attention encoded this as code, the router will route it to the code expert. If, it, the, if attention encoded this as prose, it goes to the prose expert. The intelligence is in attention. The router is just reading it out. The mixture of experts layer isn't deciding anything. It's executing decisions attention has already made. So when I said no domain experts, let me be precise. There is no math expert that handles all math. There is no code expert that handles all code, but there are specialists. The specialization isn't what you're computing, it's how you're asking. Context experts, not domain experts. One more thing. Remember that quote from OpenMOE, routing decisions are predominantly made based on token IDs with minimal context relevance? Let's run very quickly at def in different contexts with add, hello, Fibonacci, etc. And we'll do a layer by layer summary. Key thing I want you to notice here, we see the same experts hitting at E20, at E23, and at E29. We're saying the same expert for all contexts, in this case, low, low differentiation. Same layer, every layer, every context. They weren't wrong. They tested the wrong tokens. Def always predicts a function name. Context doesn't change the task plus predicts different things depending on the framing. So some tokens are context sensitive, some aren't. The paper found the ones that aren't. So if I was to accurately describe what MOE experts are doing, I think there's basically two types of specialists. There's position specialists, you know, where basically some keywords such as def are context insensitive and therefore they're always going to go to the same expert regardless of the layer. And then we have in general the context specialist where attention is the key thing. It's going to look at what comes before, um, it's going to understand the context, and that's going to come from attention, and then it's going to go to different experts based on what attention states it needs to go to. So what did we learn from this as a whole? There are no domain experts. Some experts handle math, code, language, reasoning. There's no dedicated expert to math or dedicated expert to code that owns a particular knowledge domain. Um, there's no task routing, right? Same operation can route to different experts by operand, right? Seven multiplied by eight can go to a different operand uh, from 12 multiplied by five. Multiplication in itself doesn't have an expert. Um, we did learn that trigrams reveal patterns, right? So num hop num gives you a sort of a arithmetic frame. Um, you know, um, we have things like adj um, to adj, for example, uh, and that sort of gives you uh, a sort of language frame as well. Um, again, similar for code. Once we know the patterns, or such as trigrams, um, the context frame is really what determines the expert. We can have the same plus token, but it can have different routing. Two plus three could go to E8, but then if we have the words calculate two plus three, it can go to a different expert, such as E11. If I have result equals two plus three, which is more of a code type thing, that could go to expert 14, for example. It's how you ask, not what you compute. And we also learned that ambiguity determines the differentiation for unambiguous tokens such as DEF will route consistently. They will always go to the same expert every time. But ambiguous token route by context. So plus, for example, depending on the layer, depending on the frame of the context, will go to different experts. But what we learned more than anything Attention is the mechanism. Attention is what decides. The router is a linear function. It's reading what attention wrote. Attention is literally telling you um, this is a code function, this is a map, this is the token, this is a context. It is what is deciding where it goes to what expert. The intelligence is in attention, not in the routing. So if you want to really know what mixture of experts really is, it's a disambiguation engine, not a knowledge router. 